Good evening. Welcome to all. Welcome to this latest event of uh, Policy Exchanges, Britain for the World Project. And uh, no issue, obviously, uh, more topical uh, today than this one. So uh, I feel we've uh, planning ahead. We did the right thing with this, and it turned out the decision was uh, vindicated. We vindicated also because of the uh, quality and insight of our guest of honor today, General Chung, who's uh, been a prominent player in many of the uh, most important uh, security debates in the Korean Peninsula over the last few decades. And, uh, very unusually at that time for Koreans of his generation, he was uh, brought up for a number of years in the United States, where his mother was uh, the country's first female diplomat in returning to his country. He uh, was marked out from the earliest days after graduation from the Korean Military Academy for a significant and important office, starting uh, most famously, of course, during the North Korean uh, terrorist bombing uh, in Rangoon, where the Korean foreign minister was killed, where he uh, saved the life of uh, the Korean uh, chief of defense staff, dragging him from the rubble. Latterly, he's uh, served in uh, almost every important position in the Korean army. He's been head of uh, Special Forces Command. Lastly, he was uh, the commander of uh, the First Republic of Korea Army. He's uh, served uh, also in Iraq, uh, where he was uh, head of the uh, Multinational Forces Elections Unit, so serving in a political military capacity to ensure political development in that country and also in the uh, deployment of Korean forces in Afghanistan after the kidnapping of a number of Korean citizens uh, by the Taliban. He's also more recently since his retirement from the Armed Forces of the Republic of Korea, served uh, as uh, one of the advisors uh, during the campaign of now uh, President Moon and is a frequent uh, and distinguished commentator on security affairs in the peninsula, East Asia generally. We're honored he's uh, made this trip to Policy Exchange for this uh, his uh, sole public appearance during uh, his trip here to the UK. I know you'll enjoy what he's got to say and he'll then answer questions and uh, hopefully we'll get a good discussion going. So General, thank you for making the trip. Look forward to what you have to say. Not as tall as Dean, so I'll stand here. Uh, first, I want to thank Policy Exchange for uh, availing me this opportunity to uh, meet you and maybe uh, have some exchange. I think there's something in here. Can we solve? I also want to thank all of you for the 1,078 British soldiers that have sacrificed their lives during the Korean War. I mean this very sincerely. And we Koreans have at least halfway paid the uh, debt by making our country the economic power that it is today. Uh, and we are now a pretty much a very free uh, democracy and we owe it to the sacrifices of your people. And that debt will never be fully repaid, but I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you, uh, the descendants of these great men. So today's uh, theme is, is there a military option to conquer the threat? So I'll give that answer at the end of the one hour, but uh, first, I would like to just share some of the uh, relevant facts to this question, but very shortly, and have some opportunities to entertain your questions on a broader scale, and I would uh, be flattered to uh, share my uh, opinions uh, on towards your questions. So, in 1962, that's about nine years after the Korean War, the North Koreans had a big meeting. 
And in this meeting, they decided upon four basic military policies that they would pursue in their final goal to unify the Korean Peninsula under their terms. First, they said, during the Korean War, we lost a lot of our platoon, company, and battalion commanders. So we need to make sure that our soldiers are educated and trained so that they will be able to accomplish their mission one echelon above their assigned mission. So a platoon leader would be expected to be able to uh, conduct his missions as a company commander, a company commander, a battalion commander, and so forth. Secondly, they said, the Americans, they bombed us to the Stone Age. This, will, this must never happen again. So everything must go underground. All their military factories are underground. All their um, storage facilities are underground. Even a lot of their airfields are underground. So they've been at it since 1962. A lot of their facilities are underground. Satellites cannot see where they are. And for security, most of the North Koreans don't even know what's next door. Third is, they said, we need to make sure that we arm everybody. A 14-year-old uh, teenager in North Korea probably gets more than 100 hours of military training a year. So by the age of 14, a North Korean teenager knows how to shoot an AK, fire an RPG, throw a grenade, and pitch a tent, and march 20 kilometers. So they've been at it at this since 1962. Finally, the fourth is that they must have a modern military. So until the mid 70s, the North Koreans had a far capable military than the South Koreans and the United States combined on the Korean Peninsula. They had more tanks, they had more aircraft and so forth. But I think the North Koreans realized that this was not going to be able to continue. They knew that the cycle of the lifespan of their equipment would not exceed after the 80s. So by the early 60s, they already wanted nuclear weapons. And by the early 80s, they first got their five megawatt research reactor from the Soviet Union. And in the 80s, they also uh, received their first Scud missile from the Egyptians. And they started re-engineering the technology. And now we are where we are today. So right now, the, the conclusion of all of this is that North Korea is very militarized, far beyond any kind of imagination that I think South Koreans and Westerners think they are. So oftentimes I try to explain to my Americans, look guys, if we have to go into North Korea, it's not going to be like Iraq or Afghanistan. No, it's not going to be getting rid of Hussein. It's more going to be like get, trying to get rid of Allah. So can you imagine what that would look like, trying to kill Allah in Afghanistan or, or Iraq? So that's Kim Jong-un and the Kim family is a, is a cult in North Korea. Right now, all their tanks and all their aircraft are obsolete. Their most uh, uh, modern aircraft is the Su-35, and they only have a handful of them. They have a lot of MiG-21s and MiG-19s. And you wonder, why would you have such obsolete weapon systems? probably as kamikaze types of aircraft. Load them with a lot of fuel, some bombs, have a pilot tell him and her, her that that's your target and you need to destroy it. And so they have about, I think, more than a thousand aircraft. And probably if something happens on the Korean Peninsula, there will be a lot of modern day aces uh, being born. But, uh, 
the North Koreans have this, this capability. And they have 10 bio capability. Estimates put it at maybe 2,500 to 5,000 tons of chemical and biological weapons. They also have artillery and rockets that directly threaten the capital city of Seoul. Um, he estimates somewhere about a thousand tubes. Half of that is singular artillery tubes, the other half are multiple rocket launchers. So you, you can imagine what a single salvo could deliver. They also have cyber capability. The entire state looks for talented <laughs> people. Now in North Korea, they have a system called Songbu. They categorize their own people into four classes. It's like a caste system, but more oriented on loyalties. The only area that, that, that they do not apply this caste system is picking out these uh, computer whiz kids. So by the age of 12 or 13, if he or she shows an aptitude for computers, they would choose them, train them, and eventually differentiate them into either programmers or hackers. So if you read somewhere that you know, some country like South Africa uh, has one of its banks is missing a hundred million dollars, you can probably bet five pounds that it was the North Koreans because they are able to do this. And I'm sure most of you are aware that the North Koreans have a state-run business of counterfeit cigarettes, narcotics, and the U.S. dollar. They call it the super note. And the reason they call it the super note is because uh, it's, it's so um, well made that uh, machines, counterfeit detecting machines, have difficulty uh, uh, finding it. And as the, the United Kingdom, you had the same problem, I believe, until the 60s, because the Nazis had been counterfeiting the pound as well. So you can you can uh, more relate to the kind of threat that that is. They also have a million plus men and women. Now, because the North Koreans, uh, there are about 25 million of them, and uh, they they have conscription. The men serve for 11 years. The women serve for six to seven years. Um, some estimates put the North Korean military, the standing active duty military, at 30% being women. Most of them are in our anti-aircraft uh, units, communication units, and so forth. But that's the way that. The average height of a North Korean soldier is about this high. So they fit in very nicely into a T-72 or a T-62. Uh, but they have 200,000 special forces. They're actually called, uh, translated as snipers. So to the Western mind, you think they are you know, snipers. But what the sniper is actually in Chinese is uh, roughly translated monkey units. So imagine a uh, doped up chimpanzee in this room running around, you know, uh, hitting everybody. So that's the role of these special forces to disrupt. The, the lines of uh, your enemy. So if you look at the Korean War, what, what the, the popular tactic of the North Koreans was, they would probe, they would find a weakness, they would send in their troops, these so-called Soviet sniper units, they would cut the communications to the artillery support of the main units, isolate them, and then pick them off one by one. It's a classic tactic that the North Koreans used and will use in the future. So these are the capabilities that the North Koreans have. And right now, we have a problem with, uh, with uh, you, 
nuclear weapons and the long range capability of delivering these nuclear weapons. And they've done something that no other country has really done, which is threatened the United States with the use of nuclear weapons. So that's where we are. So before we go, I go back to the question, is there a military option to counter the threat? Let me just open to uh, some of the questions and answers that questions that we might have. Thank you. General Chun very kindly agreed to answer questions as usual, has rules. No question too outrageous, just state your name and organization first. Gentleman there, name and organization. Um, describe the impressive look geosyncratic of General Truman. How sustainable? How long can they afford to have an Indian people in the Whatever equipment they can afford. They've been able to do it for the past 60 years. So that's the main reason that their economy is in the shape that it is right now. So during the Kim Jong il era, which was the father of the present uh, president over there. Uh, even when one million plus of their people were starving to death, they invested on their military and especially on their nuclear program. So they've been at it and the entire country, you could say, is like a, is like a um, uh, huge barracks. I forgot that Another thing that I wanted to mention to you is the Kim family itself. So Kim Il-sung was the, the great leader, and his son was Kim Jong-il, and now we have his Kim Il-sung's grandson, Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-il, the uh, father of Kim Jong-un, had one wife, but he had three other women. So the first wife had Kim Jong-un, the person that was murdered by with the chemical handkerchief in Malaysia. The second uh, spouse had two daughters, and we know very little of her. The third spouse had two sons and one daughter. So the eldest son is Kim Jong-un's older brother, <coughs> and the second son is Kim Jong-un, and his younger sister is Kim Yo Jong, who is now playing a seems like a significant role in the politics of North Korea. Um, Kim Jong Un is not crazy. He seems to be a sportsman. Um, unlike his father, who enjoyed wine and women, it seems he's not that kind of a person. So I'm stretching it a little bit, but it seems to me that Kim Jong-il is similar to like a Mussolini type of a leader, whilst Kim Jong-un is more of a Hitler kind of person. And not that he is a mass murderer or anything yet, but in, in the temperament of the characteristics of, 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 his, of their leadership style. So I'll just throw that to you. I forgot to mention that. Gentlemen here in the front, sorry, just wait till the microphone comes. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Frank Gardner, BBC Security Correspondent. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, are you expecting North Korea to send special forces across to the Olympics disguised as civilians? <laughs> no. Um, I don't think so. Why would they? Why would they need to do that? All they have to do is watch uh, uh, YTN, which is similar to your BBC or CNN. Uh, so I do not think so. Which reminds me of the story that I heard. So after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when all of us rose uh, near a nuclear uh, catastrophe. The Soviets and the Americans had this great idea about exchanging younger students. And the Americans said, some Americans said, are you crazy? They're going to send KGB agents. But in the end, 
that they had a student exchange program. And sure enough, the Soviets sent a lot of KGB agents disguised as students. But you know, 30 years later, when Gorbachev was trying to uh, change the Soviet Union, a lot of those KGB agents who had grown into their organization actually supported Gorbachev. So I think, I, I truly believe that my system of democracy, freedom, respect of human rights uh, is far powerful than any North Korean nuclear weapon. So I think uh, this kind of confidence gives me um, the courage to give a little bit more slack to what we can do with the North Koreans before we actually bomb them. Can I just following up on that, why would it not be in their interest to cause the kind of disruption that Frank was talking about? I think right now they're 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 a little bit off balance because of Mr. Trump. <laughs> so because of Mr. Trump, they're trying to figure out you know, is he really crazy or is he really going to do this or not? So Mr. Trump has put them off balance. So they're not going to risk it yet. Uh, my greatest fear is that the North Koreans are believing their own propaganda. And I have uh, had opportunities to talk to North Korean soldiers who have defected to South Korea. And you cannot imagine how indoctrinated they are. These are men who have defected to South Korea, and yet there is an inner belief in their system which is quite close to ridiculous. So, Lots of questions. I'm just trying to sort of get a sense to go. Lady there, if you could just wait till the microphone comes. Name an organization. So Zika Berg, Sydney Morning Herald. I'm just wondering if you think after the talks between the Koreas, uh, if you think it's crucial that the US join those, how likely you think that might be? And the US has made a veiled threat about military action. Do you think that that's now off the table after the talks, given the talks? And what role did South Korea have in US military action? I hope that tensions will lessen and that uh, this, this, the Olympics will be a good door to a peaceful resolution to all of this. That is what my heart wants. But my head and the lessons that we've learned of human nature and dictatorships like North Korea tell me that we have a long way to go. The only thing that I, as a 39-year military man, know for sure is that we need to be ready as much as we can because if you want peace, you know, the only proven real uh, lesson is prepare for war. So um, I really think that we need to do that. And uh, we must seek peace, but we must at the same time prepare ourselves for the worst. Gentlemen there. How do you Name make all the Korean people united behind their leadership? Or could there be a rebellion for obvious reasons? Sir, we are a democracy. How can we be united? We have uh, 51 million people and probably 51 million opinions. So uh, that's what you taught us to be, right? And so uh, what the Western uh, uh, nations have wanted Korea to become, we're getting there. We're not there yet. But uh, we are a very diverse uh, country now. So I would say 30% are conservatives. Yeah, sorry, my, my question was about whether the North Koreans were united behind their leadership. They, for the short, immediate term, would be united because no other kind of, um, of uh, 
other opinions are not allowed. And uh, they have a system where five to 10 families are made into a group. If a single person in that group of five to 10 families misbehave, the entire five families or 10 families go to the gulag or are executed. So everybody spies on everybody else. It's a, it's a great mechanism to keeping people under control. So um, they would be you know, uh, very tightly controlled. Now what is, what is very interesting though is, we had this incident where the North Koreans uh, in 97 infiltrated and their submarine broke out. In the submarine were 18 crewmen and they lined up and they allowed themselves to, to be shot in, in the back of their head. It was a semi kind of suicide. So th this is how determined they are. And yet, when one of them were captured, it only took us a day for him to change and uh, betray uh, information. So they're very tightly controlled but once they realize that they've been lied to, they change very quickly. So, so there's a there's a there's a divergence there. Can you say just a little more, following on from that question about what we were talking about earlier, the number of defectors under Kim Jong Un going down and now it rising again gently? Would you explain the reasons for that and the nature of the kind of defectors that have been coming? Down? So there have been about thirty thousand plus. North Koreans who have risked uh, their lives and great, great hardship to come to South Korea. Uh, and then when Kim Jong-un came to power about one, or one year later, he saw a steep decline. And the main reason was because he was putting his version of the wall along the uh, Chinese and North Korean border. And uh, so, we, and, and to a degree, it seems North Korea, their economy got a little bit better. Uh, now we are seeing a little bit of an increase in, in North Korean defection. So something is going on in North Korea, but uh, it's not as bad as, as it used to be. So under this new leader, it's an unavoidable fact that seems life is getting a little bit better. Name an organization, please. Thank you very much. Um, could you tell us... A name an organization, please. Say again. Name an organization. Right. Uh, John Young, teacher of politics and history. Can you tell me, why is it uh, that the People's Republic of China appears to tolerate this awkward name? want of a better, better expression, because of all the other countries, they surely have more influence over uh, over the GPRK than, than anybody else. It only took us uh, until very recently to realize that they don't have as much uh, influence as we thought. And it seems the Chinese feel that it is better to have a nuclear armed North Korea than to have Americans at their borders, which I think the Chinese are wrong, but that seems to be what they're thinking. So to the Chinese, um, they, they, they don't want their northern borders to be uh, adjacent to, to an American-influenced country like South Korea. And uh, the North Koreans, uh, do not feel the same as a South Korean to the Americans. And it seems their relationship is not like a, 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 a uh, alliance that the South Koreans have with the, with the United States. Gentlemen there. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Gareth Davis. I visited in North Korea 2016 at Harvard University on a research trip uh, for business. Uh, 
Belter Center at Harvard University just came out highlighting the vulnerability of the South Korean military to biological warfare, particularly thinking of the response of China and deaths and smallpox in particular. The United States military um, are all vaccinated based in the Korean territory. Could you just comment on the perceived vulnerability of the military to an attack by a biological chemical and how you rank that in terms of likelihood versus a neutrality? Um, I would decline from uh, sharing with you the capabilities of the South Korean military. Uh, but I would also agree with uh, the statement that there is a vulnerability. There is a vulnerability. Uh, another fact to that statement is from us uh, Koreans, uh, a lot of Westerners sense this calmness you know, amongst South Koreans against all this uh, South Korean uh, nuclear threat. <laughs> so from my perspective, I only live 35 miles away from North Korea, mm -hmm. which is artillery range. So whether being you know, zapped by a nuclear weapon or you know, chemical weapon or a biological weapon, to me, I'm dead anyway. So <laughs> you know, it's not that big of a deal. Um, <laughs> I try to tell my Koreans, you should not be afraid of North Korean nuclear weapons because I don't know, even if they had 100 nuclear warheads, my friend, the Americans, had 5,000, so what's the big deal? But uh, because of maybe this kind of thinking, we don't consider the, 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 the chemical threat or other kinds of threat as seriously as an outsider. So, when you go to Korea, people are very calm. They're more worried about the price of uh, price increase of hamburgers than you know, the North Korean people at this point. They're, they're a little bit worried. But. I'm just trying to see, get a sense with the lady there. Name an organization. Yeah, Helen Thomas, Blonde Money Consultancy, and former PX alumna. And um, following on from that, um, how worried if we take, if we go through history, how worried are South Koreans at this moment? You say they're not too worried, but how does it compare to, you know, um, the history of the last 30 to 40 years? And secondary to that, is there a sense of what the end game might be for um, Kim Jong-un? So I think there is no doubt in any, any South Koreans' minds that if there is war, that the alliance will win. And it's just the fact that the sheer air power that the Korean and the, the United States with British aircraft that will hopefully come to our aid uh, can inflict on the North Koreans. But because of the proximity of Seoul to the North Koreans and the fact that since they will have the initiative that we will have, we will inevitably, inevitably lose some ground. And it does us no good if you know, part of our country is in ruins. So that's the part that concerns us. We're not concerned about you know, being communized as long as we have the United States and other allies. So it's North Korea against the world right now. So, so, that, so we're not that worried about that issue. Uh, but for a person like myself, I personally would wish a little bit more awareness of the general public because you know, I don't, so we're, in, we're caught in the middle where we don't want to frighten our people, but, and yet you know, a lot of our people don't take this situation as seriously as they should. So I personally try to explain to my people Look, let's not think about war. Let's think about an earthquake. You know, what we should be preparing for an earthquake. And uh, so that's where we are. At the back, the gentleman there at the back. Someone's got their hand up there. Yep. Yep, there. Just there. Jim Anderson, my organization. I just wanted to ask if the North Koreans get fully fledged nuclear capabilities, 
How likely is it that you think that they would use that um, in order to threaten you on, say, we can't intervene, we want to reunite the, um, the Korean Peninsula, and we have nuclear weapons now, so no one can stop us? It's a good question. They've been saying over and over again that their nuclear capability is against the United States and the United States only. Some people believe it. I don't believe it. Um, <coughs> will they blackmail us? Will they intimidate us? Yes. But like I said, why, sh why should we be concerned? As long as we have an alliance with the Americans, they guarantee extended deterrence. And so, you know, like I said, the American, my friends, have 5,000 warheads. So, now having said that, we Koreans really need to think about it. If, they, if the North Koreans drop a bomb, a nuclear weapon, and, and, um, and, and contaminate 20% you know, of South Korea, is it in my best interest to drop a bomb on Pyongyang? and then you know, make that a radioactive area for the next 100 years, when we have precision munitions that can uh, kill him and his uh, family, or the perpetrators of this uh, inhumane act. So that's a, that, that's a thing that we, we, we South Koreans need to think about. So, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, the, 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 the initial thinking is, well, if they nuke us, we need to nuke them, but we really need to think about, is that the smart thing to do? Is that what we want to give to our uh, future generations? So we're, we're at that stage right now. That's a very bad, gentlemen, that's a very bad name and organization. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, David White, from the um, you're obviously saying that uh, South Koreans are reassured by uh, the support of the Americans, but Trump's rhetoric seems to be inflaming the situation rather than making it safer. What's your sort of take on that? And um, you know, is it actually is there sort of method in his madness because he's brought the two Koreans uh, together and had these talks in the last few months? So just yesterday. My president has stated that President Trump uh, deserves huge credit for the uh, two Koreas to coming to the table. So um, I don't think President Trump, or I don't hope that he is mad, uh, but uh, he, has, he has made the conditions where he has put the North Koreans uh, at an at a, imbalance. So for now, you know, um, he's actually put us in, 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 a, in a direction where uh, negotiations has started. Now, what will happen after the Olympics? Um, that's a concern, but uh, my president has been talking to, the, to Mr. Trump and uh, as long as we have that kind of close coordination and more close coordination, I think uh, we'll be able to uh, help with the foundations of the Korean and U.S. alliance and help from countries like the United Kingdom that uh, we'll be able to uh, find a better solution. Just the there, the problem. Yeah, just wait for the microphone. Thank you very much. Duncan Bartlett, editor of Asian Affairs magazine. Um, you mentioned that the North Koreans have repeatedly said that their nuclear threat was against the United States and the United States only, and you said that you were sceptical about that view. Could you say something about the connection between the nuclear tests and the intercontinental ballistic missile tests? What countries are within the range of North Korean missiles, and which countries are potential targets? United States, Japan, China, but the Chinese don't seem to be worried. I don't know what they have, but uh, they seem not to be worried. Uh, right now, 
the latest test of their uh, Pasang uh, 15 missile seems to be able to strike the U.S. capital, but that's assuming that uh, that it only has a 150 kilogram warhead. So if it had a 500 kilogram warhead, which is what we think it, you would need to have a nuclear capability, it probably would not reach the U.S. capital. Um, so, in my view, the North Koreans have not really had that capability. And uh, this is where the, the window still exists uh, for them to, uh, to, to cease where they are. So, if they want to broker a deal with the Americans, they need to do it now. Indications are right now that they're not inclined to do that. I think it's important for the North Koreans to realize that this window is closing really, really soon. And I'm a little concerned about their, their perception of this. Jump to the left. Thank you. Uh, Jack Blanchard from Politico. Um, the talk in America this week seems to be about an idea of a, what they call a bloody nose attack, where they try to take out just one facility with a single strike to sort of, as a sort of warning to North Korea that they mean business but with the hope it won't escalate into a wider conflict. Knowing what you know about Pyongyang, is that a realistic strategy, a possible strategy? I don't know, but I hope the Americans are keep talking very closely with the South Koreans about options. And that uh, no sur nobody likes surprises, right? <laughs> Unless it's a happy birthday or a diamond ring. So. Um, hopefully, the, the United States is talking very, very closely with the South Koreans and vice versa. You sound quite skeptical about it. I don't, I don't know why you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman there in the middle, yeah. Look, John Hennings, uh, Henry Jackson Society. Um, Huang Zhenyao, the senior defector, once said that. Um, North Korea's military has like founding principles to unifying the Korean Peninsula, and that this was a balance of power struggle with the Kim family. And these two things, can you speak to that? Is that um, would that describe the current relationship between the military and the Kim family? That, that unification is, is a priority. It is not now the priority because they're starving. Uh, but it is, I think it is prudent to assume that the end of the whole game is to unify the Korean Peninsula under North Korean or Kim's terms. It sounds absurd, but for many reasons, which I, I do not want to go you know, for time's sake uh, today, tonight, uh, that would be the ultimate goal of the North Korean regime. Gentlemen in the front here. Uh, let me take from yourself for stats and politics. You've highlighted multiple number of times the vulnerability of Seoul due to its physical proximity to, to the border. Are there any efforts being made to diversify political sort of political military and economic capabilities away from Seoul? Is, is it really possible? So right now, um, there are 51 million South Koreans. And in the greater Seoul metropolitan area, about 25 million people live in that area. Uh, the Korean government, from about a decade ago, has been moving their administrative governments down south to a place called Sejong. It's about the middle of South Korea. So there are that efforts uh, occurring. But you know, people uh, gravitating to Seoul has been going on for the past 500 years. And it's hard to break an old habit. I don't know if you have that in your country, but uh, uh, that's how it is in Korea. So there is an effort. But you know, it's going to take a long time. Maybe some artillery shells. 
see a lot of other questions uh, still. There's a gentleman there, I've been waiting patiently. Name and organization. James Sayer from the Western University of London. Um, I'm interested uh, in your views. You said the China don't want to have the freedom of the Uyghur and the United States family um, in the country. Do you think that China would have in the future take a position to preemptively act so that they can maintain a buffer um, against the Uyghur? I know that is a very popular concept that is shared by many Koreans, which I am not one of. If the Chinese ever are foolish enough to go into North Korea in that fashion, I will applaud them, because they are going to be uh, going into a very nasty place. And you know, if they're willing to uh, fight the North Koreans, so be it. Uh, but they better be really ready because all the problems that we have right now is going to be their problem. And it's probably a good idea for them to not go into North Korea uh, for whatever reason. In the middle there, gentlemen, next. Thanks, uh, David Nussbaum, The Elders. Um, one theory is that Kim Jong-un is mad. Um, but if we look at alternative um, hypotheses, one is that he's following a strategy, which is um, Iraq gave up its nuclear ambitions, the Americans invaded, and the leader was killed. Libya did the same, the Americans invaded, the leader was killed. Ukraine gave up its nuclear thing, and Russia took over <coughs> half the country. Um, so that, that presents a possible rational um, strategy, uh, which would suggest there are almost no circumstances in which they would give up their nuclear capability because if you're the leader and you think the Americans will try and give you more trouble, uh, nuclear weapons are probably one thing that might put them off doing that, uh, particularly because there are so many Americans in South Korea, they're not only in the mainland. What credence do you give to that uh, hypothesis? So I think it's very obvious that North the Kim family uh, is has taken lessons from these events, but I think there's another aspect where the Kim family, Kim Jong Il, the father of Kim Jong Un, uh, remarked numerous times that he compared his Kim family to the um, the royalty of Sweden, that they now were a, a, a uh, category like the queen and king, and they, that, that they would enjoy that, which is different because you know, I don't think the king of Sweden murdered or allowed 1.5 million of their subjects to uh, start there. But anyway, so they, have, they, they seem to have their own sense of confidence in their system. But they need assurances, real assurances, which is nuclear weapons. So uh, that was probably the motivation. I think what happened, though, is that in their process of pursuing nuclear capability, they went a little bit too far. Now, I don't know if you agree, but it's very hard to get the American people to go to war. As you might remember, you know, how, how uh, my favorite um, Brit, Winston Churchill, tried to get the Americans to uh, help with the uh, world in uh, the war in World War II. But I was in Arizona just two weeks ago, and the uh, the waitress serving me hamburgers when. I was introduced as a retired Korean general. She said, oh, north or south? And I said, south. <laughs> and she said, North Korea, you know, very bad nuclear weapons. And, you know, this, this young woman, probably six months ago, thought that Samsung was a Japanese company. So North Korea really needs to realize that in his pursuit of nuclear capability, he has awoken the average American, and given all justification to get his 
Can I use the word ass kick? <laughs> We've had worse before. So I, I, I'm not sure if he realizes what he has done. So if I were him, I would give up ICBM. I would give up IRBM, which is threatening Japan and South Korea. I would give up SLBM. I would give up proliferation, which is a big problem, even for you. And it would still, he would still have some nuclear capability uh, for the interim and try, try to broker a deal with the United States and the rest of the world. Time for one more question. Do I see anyone? I see somebody there in the back in the dim distance. I can't see behind the camera. Just on that side, yeah, somebody there. Name and organization. Thank you. I'm a researcher at Maitland. I just wondered if you had any comment on, further comment on the North Korea's cyber capability and whether we should be worried that they will escalate beyond the ransomware and crisis. We should be very worried. Um, about 10 years ago, they attacked one of our banks. Um, so it took us about six months to figure out it was, you know, to gather proof that it was North Korea. And then we got to thinking, why did they do that? Why did they attack one of our banks? And we later concluded that they wanted to see what our procedures were. They wanted to know who we called, what we did, who did it, who didn't do it. So that's how good they are. I would not be surprised if they are hacking into this camera right now. Uh, I, I have a cell phone and I assume that it's being monitored by somebody. So North Korea cyber capability is something that I think is right below their nuclear capability as to what they are. But before I close, I want to go back to the question, is there a military option to counter the threat? Yes, there is a military option. But it's like having a toothache. But this toothache is like having to pull out all of your teeth and then having to put it back in again. So the military option exists, but I just want to say that it should be the last option. And heaven forbid that we would have to use it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. It was an honor for me to be here and uh, entertain your questions. Thank you. The North Koreans are listening. I hope particularly they'll be uh, listening. We're very pleased to have uh, Tom Tugendhat, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, and Peter Cumbridge, also Distinguished Policy Exchange author. Tom, very grateful you found the time to come. We'll talk to you with Professor Sachs. Thank you very much indeed. I have to say that was a rather sobering uh, end to uh, a Wednesday uh, afternoon. And I'm very grateful to the General that you found time to come and speak to us, because that perspective on North Korea, that perspective on the Korean Peninsula is one that we often find very difficult to get here in the United Kingdom, despite our very close and real interest in it. We forget sometimes that actually we have huge interests in the Korean Peninsula, not just the lives of the many thousands of young men who uh, sacrificed themselves in the UN war, first serious UN conflict in the early 1950s, and not just, of course, because we have enormous amounts of trade with South Korea, I believe it's now just over 11 billion pounds a year, which is a, a phenomenal uh, amount. And I know that one of the first MOUs we signed just after the referendum uh, in 2016 was the nuclear energy one with South Korea. So we have this <coughs> enormous shared trade culture, but we actually have a lot more than that too, that's sort of less noticed. And one of them actually comes through, and I'm very glad, great, glad to see the High Commissioner of Australia here. One of them comes through uh, the Australians, because of course all of our investment, and there is a huge amount of joint investment into Australia, a lot of it goes into South Korea as well, an awful lot of Australian investment in the South Korean uh, enterprises and industries, and, and indeed particularly shipyards. So it's very good to see um, you here representing uh, the Great Commonwealth. But look, we also have a, a, another interest, and that other interest is in the rules-based international order. And there's a few points, if I may, that I will uh, make about this. And the first is that over the past 
decade or so, we've seen the UN as a largely uh, hopeless body in many parts. It doesn't seem to have quite got its act together. It doesn't seem to have quite got things over the line. I would argue that's a, a, a misperception. In some of the very fundamental areas, actually, the UN is working and working very well. One of them is on the sanctions on North Korea. If you look at the unity that that has engendered and the way that has worked, including with the stoppages of the recent uh, sanctions busting vessels by your own Navy, so a very effective operation it was too, you can see that actually the world can come together. Admittedly, it's difficult, but it, the world can come together, and the UN has demonstrated that uh, over uh, North Korea. So I'm extremely pleased to see that. I'm also pleased to see that the suggestion that has made sparingly, I'm delighted to say, that the entire peninsula should be demilitarized as the price of peace is one that has been largely rejected. Because the truth is, of course, that would be to pay the Dane with absolutely no guarantee of any future. And the real, the real danger, as the General has quite clearly pointed out, is not that the North Korean nuclear threat, although that is a real threat, it is the massive military buildup of conventional weapons that threatens Seoul even as we speak. So I'm very glad that you made that particularly clear. And I'm very glad that you also raised uh, very clearly the partnership that you have with the United States at this time when, um, frankly, quite a lot of uh, US policy strikes many of us as, as difficult to understand and is not always the easiest to interpret, uh, particularly when it's multiple sourcing it includes various elements of social media. It's important to remember that actually our alliance with the United States, our partnership with the United States, is one based on a very fundamental idea of shared values. And you made this very clear, General, when you said that your democracy, and you're right here, your democracy is more powerful than any nuclear threat that anybody can point at you. And you're absolutely right, of course, in that. I'm delighted that you made that point so clearly. But look, the UK, what is our role in this? Well, of course, the idea that we're going to militarily tip the balance, I mean, I'm, you're absolutely right, we, I'm sure, that we would uh, be very keen to contribute. And our two, our two typhoons that came to exercise with you in 2016 demonstrate that commitment. That's not the real deciding factor that you would get from us. The reality is that the UK is not going to tip that military balance. What we are, however, is we are a very active and indeed, I would argue, an even more active today, uh, exponent of the rules-based international system, and we will be a supporter of yours through the UN uh, process. And that is a process that, as I say, uh, has definitely demonstrated its work in this particular instance. Now, I know that uh, talking of the, of the Hermit Kingdom, as some people refer to it, is always difficult. So having that insight uh, from an expert like you, sir, has been extremely gratefully received, and I'm intrigued uh, that, uh, that you say that Mr. Kim sees himself, President Kim sees himself as a, as a modern day uh, equivalent of the Swedish kings. And though, um, I mean, you know, Minnie the Moocher may not uh, be going to him for the things that she be needing, it is, uh, it is really a, a struggle to understand how this hereditary uh, communist state uh, can really uh, see itself through to a constitutional monarchy that the Swedes and many others indeed we have here uh, achieved. So, but, we all hope that such a, such a transition is possible, and we all hope for a peaceful transition of power. Uh, and I think that your insights this evening have certainly helped us understand better uh, the, uh, your, your nearest neighbor and understand many of the problems you face. So if I may leave the applause and congratulate you, sir, on a fantastic speech. Thank you.